Hi, I'm the Domestic Feminist, a Morhi married mother of three, and I like to talk about the everyday challenges women face on the home front from a feminist perspective. Today I want to talk about the invisibility of chores typically done by women. Meals are made, dishes are washed, floors are vacuumed, and so on. Only for the food to be consumed and forgotten, hunger later returning, dishes dirty and awaiting their washing, and floors gritty once more. Is it any wonder why this is described as drudgery and futile, relentless, or thankless? This work is only noticed when it becomes visible, in other words, when we are not meeting expectations. Gosh, this place looks awful. What's going on? A surprising finding was discovered in a study of working middle-class married couples that the absence of communication around chores may be an indicator of a healthy and efficient partnership in which spouses display mutual respect. Couples who had clear and defined roles could go about them without discussion, whereas couples, like me and my husband, whose roles are pretty fluid, needed to discuss who was doing what much of the time. I first read this piece in 2013, and though it intrigued me, I did not know what to do with the information. I like that both my husband and I cook, clean, garden, do laundry, home finances, home improvement projects, etc. It means both of us know how to do each thing, making us more resilient if one of us falls ill or needs to travel. It means my kids see our husband cooking and me building things to better our home, broadening their understanding of what one is capable of. I love that. However, as the study pointed out, couples who work this way need to constantly communicate to coordinate, which when things are going well, is totally fine. But when there are other tensions in the relationship, the coordination becomes negotiation and chores can be the everyday battleground of inequities and grievances. Take Julie and David. Researchers observe them in the kitchen with David cooking a meal and Julie criticizing him. She does not come off well. David is having a hard time preparing the meal and is making several choices that create bigger messes, something Julie is not happy about and lets him know he will have to clean it up. She won't stop at that though. She says again and again that he does not know how to cook in a critical, negative, and exasperated tone. David takes it in stride and uses self-deprecation and humor to ease the situation, but Julie is not mollified. Later, when Julie talks about something she heard on the news, David becomes sarcastic and she comes down hard on him. It was revealed that David is temporarily out of work, and Julie's frustration about this was coming out in the discussion of chores. The couples in our study who lacked clarity on what, when, and how household tasks and responsibilities would be carried out often said that they felt drained and rushed and had difficulty communicating their dissatisfaction in their lives. It also pushed out other important relationship bonding behaviors like affection, humor, and discussion of their day. Though it is easy to sympathize with David with his self-deprecation and humor, it seems Julie is not only frustrated that he is making so many missteps causing more work, it is also that her expertise when she creates a meal has long been overlooked. Her kicking him, so to speak, when he is already down is a way to make her work in the home more visible. Another couple in this study, Travis and Alice, were similar in that Alice was also very frustrated with her partner and very critical of him. She micromanaged him, but also did not want to. When Travis suggested she write down what she wanted from him, she refused, saying she should not have to. He should know and notice the things that need tending. Conventional advice to women in these situations is that your husband is not a mind reader and that you should not nag your man. But this advice misses a key gripe women have which is that they have been doing the vast majority of mental and emotional labor. In 2017, Gemma Hartley wrote an article that started a national conversation of the hidden work demanded of women when Hartley described a recent Mother's Day experience. Her husband asked her what she wanted for her special day and she responded practically. She wanted him to research a deep cleaning service, which meant reaching out to friends for recommendations, getting estimates, get checking references, eventually scheduling and paying for the service. She had set money aside in the budget for this, so that was not the gift itself. The gift was her being relieved of some of the mental and emotional labor that is expected of her by taking care of this task that she just did not have the bandwidth to take on. Her husband did not get it. She ho he hoped she would change her mind to something he could order from Amazon, but that did not happen. 
When he finally attempted it, he only called one service, balked at the price, and then asked if she still wanted him to book the service. What she wanted was for him to research this for her and then take care of it. Like I said, he did not get it, so he just went ahead and cleaned their bathrooms for a while while she watched the kids, and as she put it, the house fell into disarray on Mother's Day. He did not get it because this thing she wanted is invisible and taken for granted. It seems at the same time like not a big deal. Why don't you just do it? While also asking too much. You sure you don't want something else like jewelry? But this is work. I have tried to talk to my husband about emotional and mental labor, but my case is not as strong as Harley's. She's clearly the glue that keeps their family and extended family together, reminding her husband about his mother's birthday, keeping track of all the school nutrition guidelines for packing lunches, arranging play dates, calling his mom to arrange childcare for when she and her husband go out, etc. I don't do all that. I do some of it, but even so, it is not as compelling as a case. Still, the invisibility of this work, that I wish I could get him to see. And that a lot of it, because it is invisible, it gets taken for granted. But maybe I don't need to get him to see it. That study I mentioned, I just recently came across it again. And this time I had different takeaways than I had back in 2013. There were two other couples mentioned that had harmonious ways of collaborating on tasks. Cheryl and Adam affectionately anticipate each other's needs as Adam barbecue their dinner. The other couple, Ray and Sam, were each the head for a separate domain of responsibilities where neither interfered. However, they did assist in each other's domain. The key to both couples seemed to be a clear respect for who was in charge or was the expert in the task and who was a facilitator. When I think about the times when my husband and my fluid approach to running our household shifts to my taking on more of the work due to him going through a busy period, the thing that bugs me the most is when I cannot do the chores in the way I have learned is best. A small example is loading the dishwasher. Through trial and error, I know the way to get the most items to fit, and for a while my husband had his own way. I told myself that he was just doing it differently and it was no big deal and every little bit helps, right? But when you're taking on more of the chore burden, efficiency is everything. And often I would have to redo whatever he put in in order to get the rest I needed to fit into the load. I was not being picky. This was not petty. This was about what works. And because I more frequently loaded the dishwasher, I had become expert in it. I finally insisted that he had to load the dishwasher in a particular way and he agreed. And thank goodness, because now when I'm putting the dishes away, I'm doing it with my baby in a baby carrier, which makes it so much more awkward with her body putting more distance between me and the dishwasher, sometimes straining my back. Something my husband is more expert in and is more personally invested in is the preparation of our meals. I used to do a lot of them, but I'm just not as in tune with creating well-balanced meals for us all each day and over the course of a week. But my husband is and always has. But because he commuted from the city, it made sense for me to cook dinner. I did okay, but sometimes he would add a side dish of a food group I missed. Over time, I stopped trying to do it all, the cooking, the cleaning, the bathing of children, the laundry, and let more and more of the food prep go, and my husband seamlessly slipped right in. By then, he was commuting only three days a week, which made it easier, and he was just more suited to it. And I did more and more of the cleaning, which I'm more expert in. Then at the beginning of the pandemic, we discovered I was pregnant and we decided that he would do all the errands, which mainly meant grocery shopping. And because foods often made me nauseous and my husband liked cooking me whatever meals I craved, I now rarely did any meal prep. Like the studies Raya and Sam, we were now in charge of two different domains. And it is great. Before, when I was falling behind, I would ask my husband to do more, and his response was, I can't do anymore. I'm already doing so much. And then we would argue about how much each of us was doing because the ambiguity made each other's contributions less visible. Remember, a problem with this work is that it is only seen when it's not done, and even if it is done, give it a minute, and it needs to be done again. Among the couples we studied, mutually shared understandings of responsibilities minimize the need for spouses to evaluate and manage one another's task-related behaviors. 
Demands were few, disengagement in the face of demands was unnecessary, and partners were more likely to feel respected for the contributions they made. Conflict was more prevalent when the couples had not worked out a clear division of labor in the home and had to renegotiate responsibilities from one day to the next. So going forward, I think I'm going to focus less on trying to get my husband to understand emotional and mental labor as it pertains to the frustrations I have in home life, and more in establishing boundaries where each of us is the head of a domain of responsibilities with expertise establishes how others jump in and assist. Thanks for watching. I hope this was helpful to you. If it was, please give this a thumbs up and consider subscribing and sharing with others. Below in the show notes are links to the study and the article I mentioned. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.